So you want to get into tabletop RPGs, but Dungeons and Dragons? I mean, look at all that math. Look at those detailed rules and classes. Ah, so restrictive. You want to be wild and creative with fewer rules. What system could... Fate, it's in the title of the video. I don't know why I'm even doing this. The Fate Core RPG system is an incredibly versatile and fun way to change up your role-playing or just to get into role-playing in the first place. Less math, more special words. I have special words. But hey, even though Fate is known to be a bit more of what we like to call rules light, it is still rulesy enough that it can be a little intimidating. So allow me to teach you all the basics, and after this video, you should know how to play Fate. Here's just the quickest little rundown of Fate. Fate system is derived from the Fudge gaming system, which means nothing to most of you and isn't the point of this video. Moving on, Fate can take place in any setting. Fantasy, superhero, sci-fi, murder mystery, whatever. I think the best place to start to understand this system is by looking at the character sheet. Name and description are exactly what they sound like. Skills give a numeric value to how good you are at something. Any action you do in Fate is linked to a skill. Aspects are descriptive phrases that denote things that set you apart from others and are used to give you various bonuses and challenges. Stunts are special abilities that let you do things with skills that players normally can't do. Extras is a broad term that covers basically special rules, items, or systems for your game setting, which can cover everything from magic to superpowers, specialized gear, vehicles, organizations. It's a blanket term, and since this video is about the basics, we won't spend too much time on extras apart from how to easily implement them. Stress is kind of how you measure your character's ability to resist damage in combat. Consequences is the measure of damage taken, which comes in the form of negative aspects, which can be used against your character. Basically, they're the injuries you sustain. Refresh is the minimum number of fate points that you'll start a session with. And to help round it out, here are a few important terms that are not in the character sheet that I think you'll want to know. Fate points. You spend these to do various things in-game. Shift. When you roll a skill, the shift is the numeric value that you got above or below what was required. For instance, if you rolled a 5 on a lore check to understand a book, and the game master set a difficulty at 3, you have a shift of 2. Anyway, let's break all these pieces down so we can understand it. Here's the list of skills in Fate. Depending on your game's setting, you can add new ones or get rid of some of these. They're just meant to cover every potential action you would take in-game. So, something like technology might make sense if you're running a sci-fi game, but isn't going to mean much in a medieval fantasy. Now, starting out, you get to take four of those skills and put them at average. Three get to be fair, two are good, one is great. The rest are mediocre. You use these skills as the base for all of your actions. When you do an action in-game, you choose one of these skills and roll four fate dice, which can either come up as plus one, negative one, or zero. You can also just use normal d6s like this if you don't want to buy special dice. You take the total that you rolled, add your skill rank modifier, and that is how well you did at the action. These skills are the foundation of fate, as it were. And if skills are the foundation, then next it's time to look at the uh, house that fate lives in. This, this is a metaphor. So good. Aspects are short, descriptive phrases of importance. As a character, they help define who you are, your history, your connections. They can be just about anything you want. 
As a character, you have a high concept, which should be like the core concept behind your character, such as Disgraced Sword for Hire, Exiled Smith of Clan Ironstone, or Sorcerer with Unwieldy Powers. Then you need a trouble, which should be something your character struggles with, like Drinks to Forget, Short Fuse, or Wanted Dead or Alive by the Mages Guild. Your other three aspects you often work out as a group and can include things about how your characters met, what adventures led to that meeting, other things from your past, and they should reflect that stuff, like My Father's Cursed Blade, Don't Touch the Sorcerer, or The Solution is Fire. You can even hold off on choosing these and figure them out mid-game during the first session, if the GM allows it. But do you see how aspects can range anywhere from personality quirks to relationships to items of great importance that you happen to have? But these are just the frame of the house. Are we still doing that metaphor? Sure. Aspects are more than just descriptive phrases, though. You can actually use them in-game or invoke them. After rolling a skill, even after you see the results of your roll, you can spend a fate point to invoke an aspect in order to either gain plus two, re-roll your dice, give plus two to an ally as teamwork, or give plus two to a passive opposition, like bracing a door someone is trying to break down. For example, let's say Strongbeard here is trying to examine a strange piece of armor, so they roll their craft skill and get a two, but the GM said they needed a three. Well, they might say, I'm an exiled smith of Clan Ironstone, so can I invoke that aspect for plus two? The GM says, sure, and boom, Strongbeard now succeeds by one shift. As long as you can come up with a compelling reason why an aspect might be of some benefit to a skill roll, you should be able to invoke it. Of course, you'll note that these aspects don't read as 100% positive. That's because aspects should be well-rounded with positives and negatives because one of the few ways to earn fate points is to have an aspect used against you with what is called a compel. A compel is a complication that arises because of one of your aspects, either some story twist happening that will negatively impact you, or some decision your character makes being influenced by that aspect. For example, the GM might say, hey, you have your father's cursed blade aspect and are trying to ask for information in the church. So unfortunately for you, the priest sees this blade and demands you leave. This might hinder your plans, but you gain a fate point that you can use later, and most importantly, it makes things more interesting and gives you a new challenge to overcome. What's more, players can suggest compels to the GM. That way, you can kind of control how you earn fate points, and also, the complications are fun. So wow, aspects are cool. They really make characters interesting. Yeah, they do, but uh, here's the thing. Aspects aren't just for characters. In Fate, there are character aspects, sure, but there are also game aspects, which describe the setting and campaign, situation aspects, which are part of a scene or battle, boosts, which are aspects that you create that can be used just once, and consequences, which are negative aspects that reflect injuries you've sustained. And all of these aspects can be invoked or compelled. Players can invoke game aspects. The GM can have NPCs invoke a situational aspect in combat. One of your fellow players might suggest a compel against you with one of your aspects if it makes sense to the scene. And some NPCs in areas might have hidden aspects that you have to discover and then you can use them. Aspects are what make fate so much fun. They allow players to find creative ways to tackle every situation. Some aspects you can always count on, others are coming and going, and some you can literally create. But if you want to use them, just make sure you've got enough. When you create your character, you have what is called a refresh, which starts at 3. That's the minimum number of fate points your character will begin a session with. If you ended the last session with 0, you start with 3. But if you ended with 4, you'll start at 4. 
because refresh is just your minimum starting fate points. Uh, unless the last session ended a whole scenario, then your fate points reset back to three, I guess, whatever, it's not important. So, we already know that fate points are used to invoke aspects, and that you earn more by taking compels. Well, you can also use fate points to refuse a compel. Yeah, if the GM is trying to put you in hot water but you just aren't having it, instead of earning a new fate point, you can spend one to avoid that nonsense. Not always recommended because, as we've covered, trouble is interesting and fun in role-playing games, but sometimes if that trouble's just too much, forget about it. Well, so wait, that means you can refuse a story detail from the Game Master. What is this power? Is this the power of fate? Hey. Hey buddy, you can do more than just refuse story details. You can propose whole new ones. Yep. If it's appropriate and if the GM agrees, you can spend a fate point to declare a story detail as long as it's based on one of your aspects. So for instance, upon entering a town, Strongbeard, our exiled smith of Clan Ironstone, might propose that another former member of the clan has a shop in town. If the GM likes it, point well spent because that right there could be a darned useful contact. Or maybe a shop that you can get a discount at. And the final thing you can do with a fate point is power particularly powerful stunts. Oh, which reminds me. Stunts are ways that your character is able to alter the way a skill works, special to them. Every character starts with three stunts, but you can purchase more at the cost of lowering your refresh one-to-one. -one. Stunts provide bonuses in a number of ways, but should always be balanced enough that they aren't useful all the time or don't completely overshadow a skill. One thing a stunt can do is give a skill a different action. For instance, stealth isn't normally a skill you can attack with, but if you create the stunt backstab, then you could use stealth to attack so long as your target isn't aware of you yet. Or perhaps you make a stunt called personable, where you can use rapport in place of contacts to make connections, but only once in a new town. Stunts can also give plus two bonus to your role in specialized circumstances, or create an effect worth plus two. If you have the stunt Herbalist, you would gain plus two for any lore skill rolls that relate to plants. You can also use stunts to create exceptions to standard rules. This video is just a primer and won't cover every rule of fate, just enough to get you started, but here's a few examples. Normally in combat, if an enemy attacked you by throwing a knife, it would be a shoot attack and you would have to roll athletics to defend against it. If you succeeded that defense roll by more than two, you normally would create a boost for yourself, a one-use aspect to help you in combat, like fast on your feet. But you could theoretically create a stunt called catch and release, where you can inflict a one-shift stress to the enemy by catching and throwing the blade back. Now, most of the time, using a stunt is free because they don't always come up. However, maybe you have an idea for a stunt that is noticeably more powerful. Then, activating that stunt would cost a fate point, or maybe even more than one. There isn't a hard and fast rule for this, and honestly, it might depend on the setting. In a superhero setting, you might want overpowered stunts that aren't limited by fate points, but in a grittier setting, you might want to restrict stunt power with fate points. You could also restrict stunts by limiting how often they can be used, or maybe even having them cause stress. Fate is all about easily customizing the system to your particular setting. Anyway, how do stuff? In Fate, when you use a skill, you are taking an action. There are four types of actions. Overcome. This is the catch-all use of a skill. There's either a passive opposition, which means something with just a set difficulty, like pushing open a heavy stone door might be a fair or plus two difficulty, and so your goal is to get more than that on an athletics roll. Or an overcome action is against an active opposition, which just means the opposition, often an NPC, is also rolling, so you won't know what you need to beat until you both roll. Create an advantage. This means that you're trying to create an aspect that you get to invoke for free. This could be like using athletics to knock over a statue in a museum, covering the ground in a stones and rubble aspect, 
that you could then invoke your next turn in combat without spending a fate point. Attack. This means that you're going to try to apply stress to something, either physically through fight or shoot, or mentally with provoke. We'll cover stress in a bit. Most other skills can't attack unless you have a particular stunt or extra that might allow that. Defend. This is what you roll to avoid being harmed, or to oppose someone else trying to overcome you or create an advantage to use against you. There are a few skills that it just doesn't make sense to defend with unless you can come up with a creative enough stunt. Now, with each of these actions, there are four possible outcomes. Fail. You fail your action. Or succeed at a major cost. Yeah, in fate, even a failed roll can still often mean success, but the GM will only offer you success at a cost that will likely make your life harder. Try to athletics roll that stone door open and failed? Well, you can succeed, but only if your character takes a minor consequence of a dislocated shoulder. Or if you're creating an advantage, you do, but an enemy gets the free invoke of it. Tie. You succeed, but at a minor cost. So, you tied with the athletics roll to open the door. So, you do, but it makes a bit more noise than you expected, possibly alerting enemies. If you tie in an attack action, you don't hurt them, but you get a boost. And if you're creating an aspect, it isn't quite the aspect you wanted. Succeed. You... you did it. Succeed with style. Ooh. You've succeeded, but with benefits. If you're doing an overcome action, you'll get a boost, creating an advantage, and you'll get two free invokes of it. Attacking, and you could reduce the damage by one and gain a boost. Defending, and you gain a boost. Now let's talk. So a battle's gonna start. Make some rolls, see who goes when, so you know turn order. Cool. Now, in other games, you've got grids, maps, you're measuring distance, 30 feet per turn. Let's simplify that. In Fate, your map will have zones, which divide either larger areas or areas that would take time to traverse in between, like if there are stairs or a fence, I don't know. Some battles might just be one zone, some might be five. Next, we set up the situation aspects. There might be aspects that affect the whole battlefield, like dark, windy, etc. And there might be some that only affect certain zones, like covered in rocks or on fire. Okay, we're all ready. Fight! On your turn, you get one action. Most often, that will be attacking. If you are attacking with fight, it can be against anyone in the same zone as you. If you attack with shoot, your target can be up to two zones away, usually, but it depends on the weapon. You can also move up to one zone in addition to your action, so long as there is no aspect that would impede your movement. If you want to move two zones, or through an aspect that would get in the way, then you need to roll an appropriate overcome action, which counts as your action for that turn. Alternatively, if you didn't want to attack, feel free to try and create an advantage. Maybe there isn't an on-fire situation aspect, but you want there to be one, so create an aspect. And if you roll well, you get to invoke it for free. Now, if you're being attacked, or if an opponent is trying to do some other action against you, you'll get to roll a defend action on their turn. Now, let's say an enemy attacked you with fight and rolls a 4, and you use an athletics defend action and you get a 2. Your opponent just beat you by 2 shifts. Well, my friend, it's time to talk about... First, stress. See these boxes? By default, you have a 1 and a 2 shift physical and mental stress and can gain additional boxes by having higher ranks in the physique and will skills, respectively. Let's focus on physical for combat right now and say that you have three stress boxes. So, you just took two shifts of damage. If all of your stress boxes are clear, you would check off your two-shift physical stress box. But what if your two box was already checked? Well, then you would have to check your three box as the box has to be equal to or higher than the damage you took. 
Okay, well, what if you took three shifts of damage? Could you then just check your one and two box to equal three? Unfortunately, no. You can only check one box per hit you take. So then, what if you took three shifts of damage, but your three shift box is already filled? Well, then you would have to head over to consequences. Consequences, as you can see, have shift numbers just like stress and work much the same way. So if you took three shifts of damage, you would have to take the moderate consequence, as the minor can only hold up to two shifts of damage. As you might recall, consequences are aspects that are almost always pretty darn negative in nature. They're basically descriptions of injuries. A minor consequence might be blurred vision for taking a punch to the face, or bruised hand for someone's face punching your fist. A moderate consequence would be something like a bad cut or first-degree burns, and severe consequences could be a broken bone or bleeding out. And since enemies can use your aspect against you, you can imagine these are dangerous to have. What's more, consequences don't just heal after taking a long rest at a campfire, my friends. Stress, those boxes clear after the battle is over, but consequences have more lasting con uh. To get rid of consequences, first, you will need to succeed on a recovery action with a difficulty equal to the shift value of the consequence. After you do the recovery action, the aspect doesn't go away, but changes to a different aspect to represent healing. Broken bone suddenly becomes arm in a splint. Bad cut becomes stitched up side. Then they need time to heal. Minor consequences take a scene to heal after recovery. Moderate consequences take a whole session. If you rolled your recovery roll in the middle of one section, it doesn't heal until the middle of the next session. And severe consequences take a whole scenario. Once that time has passed, erase the consequence and you have that slot free to be used again. There is also an extreme consequence, which is up to eight shifts, that you can take if you so choose. But why don't we see it on the sheet? because it literally overwrites one of your character aspects. You'll need to replace an aspect, it can't be your high concept, with an extreme consequence, like severed arm or something equally as harsh. What's more, you don't get a recovery roll for this one. You're stuck with it until the end of a story arc when you level up, then you can rename it to something that indicates you are past the worst of it but still reflects that it happened, so severed arm might change to learning to use my new prosthetic. Choosing to take an extreme consequence is something that changes your character, so don't do it lightly. If you don't want to take a bunch of awful consequences, fate also very much presents the option of conceding a conflict. Your character gives up and even gains a fate point for doing so. But if one character concedes, that doesn't mean your other party members will, it just means that you are out of the fight and don't want to risk more consequences. And after hearing about them, who can blame you? Enemies can also concede. You certainly don't have to do that in your games, but it's something fate encourages you to look at. Finally, as far as death. Well, if you're out of stress and consequences to take to buy off the shift of a hit, then you are taken out. Now, there's no death rolls or anything like that, you're just unable to take any action at this point. Whether or not an enemy will take their next action to just kill you is, well, up to how your group wants to play your particular game. If you want the game to be gritty and harsh, then all it takes is an action on someone's part to end you, but for a lot of games, that isn't necessarily the most interesting option. Or maybe you could come up with an extra that changes how death works, which we'll cover extras in a bit. Y'all just do what makes you happy. You wanna know what makes me happy? Leveling up! Milestones are fate's version of leveling up. There are three types of milestone. Minor milestones typically occur at the end of every session of play. These allow you to rename a moderate consequence to indicate recovery and do just one of the following. 
switch the ranks of any two skills, change one stunt to a different stunt, purchase a stunt, it still costs one of your refresh, rename one character aspect, not your high aspect. Significant milestones occur at the end of a scenario. Think of scenarios as acts in a movie or play, so at the end of a significant plot point. With this, you get one of the minor milestone benefits and both of the following. Rename a severe consequence to indicate it as recovering. Gain one skill point that can either buy or increase one skill. Note, skills are like a pyramid, so you can't have two great skills and only one good skill. You'd need at least two good, so pyramid or plateau, I guess. It just helps keep the game balanced. Finally, major milestones occur at the end of a major story arc. Think the end of a movie or whatnot. You get the benefits of both a minor and significant milestone along with all the following. Rename an extreme consequence gain one refresh or buy a new stunt, advance a skill beyond the campaign's current skill cap if you can, rename your high concept if it makes sense. I mean, if the end of this campaign kind of resolved what the high concept was about, kind of makes sense your character's main motivating aspect might change for their next adventure, right? I mean, what more could you want? I mean, literally anything else would just be extra. Okay, so I won't get super detailed into this, but extras can be anything from a system of magic in your world, to weapons and armor, to whatever special game system you want. Extras are basically just special rules for your particular game. Typically, an extra needs a permission and a cost. Permission is the justification for having the extra. So for instance, if your world has magic, the permission might be that a character has to have an aspect that reflects training in that kind of magic, like initiate in the school of Arcanus. The cost of an extra is how you pay for it, which can be refresh points, skill points, make it a stunt, fate points, some combination of those or whatever. For our little magic idea, it might use ranks in the lore skill and cost fate points if you decide to use an attack action. Or maybe it causes will stress to use and uses up a stunt. And this is just one of many, many examples of how you can make your game extra. The rules of fate are simple so that you can add whatever extras you want to make the game work for you. Oofta! That's Fate Core! There are other situational rules and whatnot that you'll learn and look up as you go, but this should be everything you need to get started playing this amazing tabletop RPG. On their website, they have all the alternate rules to play Fate in different settings, or to simplify it more so that it's even more rules light. Best of all, all of this is free if you want it to be. But if you love it, show it by sending some cash their way. Their fate is in your hands? <laughs> check, check out my links in the description. I, I love you all. <laughs>